Hello there, Kansas City. Stephen St. John here with another episode of Hot Mike with SSJ. Uh, a little bit delayed with the recording uh, today because uh, Steve St. John Sr. apparently could not find the radio station, and so he doesn't want to be asked about that. And here he is, a little late. That's fine with the hot coffee, and so he'll be uh, he'll be our studio audience. So glad you could make it, Dad. Thanks for yeah, uh, thank you. Just don't stand in front of a microphone here. Take take this chair. No, I would. No, I don't sit down. Take this chair over here, and just sit and watch everything like you're a you're a judge. Maybe maybe you don't want to be a judge. Maybe that's wrong. I think you should just sit in the corner. Sit in the corner. Bring back old yeah, memories. Yeah. That would be some irony. Let's sit up here. Okay. So as you can see, wow, here we go. As you can see, a uh, you know, uh, uh, a regular guest on the uh, podcast, my dad Steve St. John Seniors here. Uh, we have uh, Mike Albanese, who's been on the podcast before. Back again. And you got uh, a lot of good uh, response from the year appearance. What was it, last year? Was it last year already? It was. Damn. It was last August, I believe. And then we talked about that. We talked about this book that was being written, and you said at some point we'd have the author, and here we have Frank Hayde, who is with us. Frank, uh, welcome to the podcast. And then we find out that uh, my producer of my morning show, Marco Marquez, uh, his mom used to be your next door neighbor in Prairie Village, and Marco used to shovel uh, the your parents' driveway yeah. back in the day. So I don't I don't know what just happened. It was like a reunion of sorts, right? That's great. I love it. It's a big city, but it's a small town. Yeah, yeah. Everyone knows everyone, and so let's and so this is you, you have several books here that you've written, and so let's talk about this first. Let's get some background on you. So you're from Kansas City, right? Right. My family goes way back in Kansas City, uh, clear back to the 19th century, and they were uh, involved. They were bricklayers from Ireland, came over and uh, got involved with uh, building contracting, built some prominent buildings in Kansas City. And they were also machine politicians back in the Pendergast era. Okay. And uh, my dad is 97, still alive, and he used to tell me stories about the 30s, 40s in Kansas City. Tom Pender, he remembers Tom Pendergast. Um, and that's what kind of got me interested in KC history. And so uh, before you were uh, an author, now you worked in law enforcement, correct? Correct, yes. I'm, I'm still in law enforcement. Oh, so you are. So t- yeah. can, you, can you tell us? Uh, hold on. Settle down. All this, he <laughs> sat up all of a sudden. Hold on now. We, we're, we're all friends here today. <laughs> and his guard's up now. And so, can can you? And I'm a fed too. Can can you tell us? uh, Hold on, let's clarify that. Uh, I'll I'll let him explain the definition and definition of law enforcement. Okay. So yeah. So uh, so I'm uh, uh, my day job is a a U.S. park ranger. Okay. And uh, I've uh, been doing that for close to 30 years. Uh, In fact, one of my early stints was at the Harry Truman National Historic Site. Oh wow! Which is run by the National Park Service. People don't really understand how that works but that's the same agency that runs Ye- yellowstone yosemite the grand canyon all these big places out west but they also we also manage historic sites all over the country and uh, my little short stint at harry truman also kind of is really what you know where a lot of this interest grew out of um i heard my dad's stories and then i i started working there and telling those stories about truman and pendergast and that led to johnny lazia and the KC mob, and uh, you know all this fascinating history that was going on here. So that's kind of how how my two worlds intersected. There. Okay, so what what was the first book that you wrote? So the first book was this one here. This is the Mafia and the Machine: The Story of the Kansas City Mob, and that's about the intersection of organized crime and politics in <laughs> Kansas City from the early, well, from the late 19th century all the way up into the 1980s. That was the first book ever published about organized crime, the, the mafia in Kansas City, and it's still in print today, many years later. And uh, it's, a, it's a, just a fascinating story. Do you ever get any pushback from any of the subjects or the families that you wrote about? no. Um, you know, it, it, by the time I wrote it, it was all pretty much ancient history. Again, it ends in the 1980s. With so is that 2007 when you wrote yeah, it? Okay, right, yeah, right, 2007. And uh, by then, um, you know, again, a lot of it is takes place in the 30s, 40s. 
Um, but it does go on up into the 80s, and some of the guys were still alive, some of the people that were featured in that book. Um, but uh, there wasn't any rumor in there or any uh, anything that wasn't already documented right. in other sources. And uh, So, no, I, there was really no pushback. At that point, when the book came out, I think people realized that the Casey outfit had passed into history and was now a part of Kansas City as previous like jazz or barbecue. On the other hand, there wasn't a lot known about it. You know, the average person in Kansas City really hadn't heard these stories. And so when it came out, people were reading this and they're like, this happened in KC? And it's kind of jaw-dropping stuff. A lot of big things happened. You know, um, it's stuff that uh, really leaps off the page, you know events that include um, international, I mean, national level politics, um, explosions, you know, hits, um, a lot of intrigue, you know, and a lot of overlap with labor unions and professional sports even, um, so all kinds of stuff. So, and, and before we get into the new book, uh, please mention your other sure. two books so, for people uh, that are out there. Yeah, after the Mafia and the Machine, I got a call from the DiCapo family from Italian Gardens, a well-known, iconic restaurant in Kansas City. Um, it was downtown at 12th and Baltimore for more than 75 years. Everybody went to the gardens. Uh, anyway, they liked my first book, and so they hired me to write the story of their restaurant, which I quickly discovered was also the story of Kansas City. A lot of stuff happened in that restaurant. Yeah, right? I mean, uh, so the subtitle is... The title is Italian Gardens, and the subtitle is A History of Kansas City Through Its Favorite Restaurant, because uh, the restaurant was like a microcosm of the city, and all the personalities of the city passed through there, the well-known people, but also the average Joe. You know, It was a place where you could get an affordable meal, and so everybody, literally everybody went there. It was a cross-section of the city. You know, um, You'd have people in there, um, you know, wealthy people sitting right next to somebody who was spending their last five bucks on a plate of spaghetti. So it was a great cross-section of the history of the city. And that was a really fun book. Uh, it spans from the 20s, 1920s, all the way up until the restaurant closed, which was in, uh, what was it, early 2000s. Of course, he has T. St. John Sr., close confidant of the DiCapo family, as he uh, looks through that book. And then your last book, you were telling me before, I, I, I'm going to have to get my hands on this one, being the boxing fan that I am. Yeah, Tell so, me about this here. So this, uh, Stan Levy, jazz heavyweight. Stan Levy was a well-known jazz drummer. In the, if, you, if you're if you really into jazz, you've probably heard of Stan Levy because he helped develop bebop music with Charlie Parker from Kansas City and Dizzy Gillespie. And he was the early drummer in those early bebop bands. He was not from Kansas City, but there is a lot of Kansas City in that book because of Charlie Parker. But Stan Levy was from Philadelphia. And you fight fans out there know that Philadelphia is like the, you know, That's right. capital of American boxing. And he grew up there uh, back in the 30s. And by the 1940s, his father was a fight promoter, a guy named Dave Levy. And he was closely associated with uh, Blinky Palermo. I don't know if you've ever heard that name, but mm -hmm. Blinky Palermo and Frankie Carbo were the two uh, mob-connected fight man. What do you call them? Were they promoters? Were they managers? Not really. They were just the behind-the-scenes guys right. that pulled all the strings and basically ran the business of boxing. They decided who won. They decided who won, right. even. The yeah. Don Kings of that's that right. era. They were the Don. You, that, that's exactly right. They decided who got the title fights and everything else. They right? decided who got the best fights. They they had controlled televised boxing back when it was you know back when you could watch fights every Friday night on free network television. Um, so those guys were uh, Stan Levy grew up in the gym with uh, you know Blinky Palermo and a whole stable of of Philadelphia fighters, and he became a heavyweight boxer himself before he even before he was a, a famous jazz drummer so interesting life story there so and all these books available amazon or wherever else you can get books yeah right. amazon um 
you know, is they're all, yes, they're all on Amazon. Okay. And so the new book that we're here to talk about is uh, Mafia Dreams, a true crime saga of young men at the end of an era in Kansas City. And so uh, there you see the cover, and this is available right now. And this book appeals to me because you, know, you remember from the conversation we had, uh, Mike, how, how old are you? I just turned fifty one. So you're yeah, and, I, and I'm I'll I'll be fifty one. About the same age in uh, in 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 November, and so you know we kind of had same circles, a lot of mutual friends and everything else. And growing up, being the the junior to his senior, I saw a lot. I it was it was a lot of things that happened in the seventies and eighties. I was either, I, I can remember vividly, or I was you know, I was there in the same neighborhood, or just you know from. The, was of the Virginia Tavern. Remember what the we were just in the same parking lot at my Aunt Marguerite's house when that when that whole thing happened. But anyway, so this has all always appealed to me uh, because when I was reading one of the reviews, you had mentioned that a lot of these books or these movies they all end up end in the nineteen eighties, right. and then you 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 know you were interested. Okay, so what happened after that? Yeah, and so you talked about how people don't quite understand how important uh kansas city was in all this and i remember one of the first things that really struck a chord with people and i'm not i don't know how accurate it was but i remember asking my dad and he said there was a lot of uh, accurate elements to it when the movie casino came out remember and kansas city was such a big part of that i remember being in the movie theater watching that and they're mentioning in kansas city and everyone's you know yeah, yeah. and then the grocery store in kansas city when they're getting bugged and it, it sank the whole deal and so that caused me to do a lot of research and ask him. And we lived in Northeast on Van Brunt. He told me the house that they raided was right around the corner from us. And so that I was, I was always fascinated uh, by that. And so tell me a little bit uh, about why you wanted to write this book. Like I said, you wanted to, you know, maybe examine what happened when all these movies and all these books end in the 1980s. Uh, you know, maybe what happened a little bit after that. Yeah. So, well, it really kind of grew out of the Italian gardens book because one of the, well, several of the main characters in this book, including Michael Albanese here, Albanese, excuse me, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time in Italian gardens. And so there's a small story within the Italian gardens book about this character named Joe Riley, who came into Kansas City in the early 90s with his family. And his family, the Riley family, was basically a crime family unto themselves. They were white collar, uh, involved in big time insurance fraud, and so that was the genesis of it. Um, but it, I realized that Joe Riley's story and what happened to Joe Riley and Michael uh, and other people, young guys, guys who were young guys in the '90s, my age, I'm 53. Um, you know, all this, all this happened to them, and I had not really heard about it. At the time, I was busy with other things, um, and I didn't really know, I didn't know about this story. And, but it, it, it occurred to me that um, what they were experiencing um, was kind of a window into uh, the KC underworld of the 90s. Um, you know, again, after, like you said, Steve, it, it, the story always ends in the 80s. Mm-hmm. So uh, I was curious about what was going on still in the 90s where there was young guys in Kansas City who were still either a part of that life or on the fringes of that life or trying to break into that life. Uh, somehow they were still connected to that, that life and that long tradition um, that existed here in Kansas City for 100 years at that point. So that was kind of how that came together. So, like, I, you know, like I said, I, I lived in Northeast until 97, 97 or 98. And so, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, yeah. if you remember it differently. And so, like, you know, my, my dad went away in 90, right? And I remember that, that span of time from 90 until about 95 or so uh, when I figured things out. And um, there, there was a year or two when you have this, you know, I'm, I got to live up to you know, Steve St. John Sr. And I didn't necessarily want to go to school. So there was a year off when, you know, I, I thought 
you know, which way is my life going to go? And I, I felt like there was a lot of my friends or a lot of guys, they were either sons of people that were involved, nephews, cousins, or whatever, and felt like this is the path, but the, it, it wasn't the same, right? And so, the, the, because, I mean, you, and you can, I don't know, did you, did you affirm that when he said the mafia pretty much is dead and gone now? It's not the same. Is that, is that accurate? You're giving me a, 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 a dirty look right now. Just, you got to say something. You, it's right. Okay. So, uh, in, 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 I think the decline had started from the, the, the height of the power in the seventies and eighties, but there were still a lot of people that, and, and you can describe it, Mike, you lived that, right? There was, what, what was it like in, in, in the nineties that's, that's, that is described in this book? I mean, the nineties were, were a interesting time, but it, they were difficult times for young men such as myself because we were coming out of the 80s, which was, you know, all about excess and wealth and, you know, the, the, the Wall Street guys, the Michael Milkins, the Pablo Escobars. And in the, in the 90s, the drug war was at all-time high. Um, and, you know, for young men such as myself that mistakenly took to the streets or thought we wanted to carry a torch that – was no longer lit. Uh, it was difficult Perfect because way to put that. Yeah. a lot of people don't realize that the 1994 crime bill uh, was enacted in 1994 by President Bill Clinton. And in the mid to late 90s, there's a thing called truth and sentencing, which they were locking people up and throwing away the key. There was no more eight year, 10 year, 12 year sentences. It was, it was running back numbers, 30 years, 35 years, so life, where, where life was this? without. In relation, I remember the campaign, uh, yeah. you know, Basta, enough, right? <clears throat> Where it felt like people, you know, were, you know, especially times were getting fucked with too much. So wh when was, like, what, around what year was that in relation to what we're talking about here? Yeah, Basta was 91. Okay. And yeah. that's described, and we go into depth on that in the book. Um, and that was really the brainchild of Sam Mirabli, um, who participated in this book. He was really great. You know, in terms of giving us time and interviews, and, um, I remember those bumper stickers inside yeah. everywhere. Yeah. It became yeah. a movement. Yeah, it was a big and, deal. And I'll add that on to to what I was saying about the '80s and the transition into the '90s. Basta really came about because these U.S. attorneys' offices, specifically in Kansas City, had nothing to do. You know, they had built these organized crime task force. And all the guys were either in prison, inactive, retired. There, there wasn't anything going on for them to still exist. So they started targeting sons and nephews and grandsons. And really, it, it, it's a, it, it was a complete abuse of power and government overreach, which was why BASTA became BASTA. Um, it, it's also, in my opinion, why they were able to fly planes into buildings because they were so focused on young Italian men and what we were doing. I mean, I had, I had agents assigned to me who, hit, who were assigned to mob bosses back east. Like, I'm a 20-something-year-old kid. You know, go pay attention to some of the people that are really involved in terrorism or trying to destroy this country rather than follow some young Italian kids around the streets or calling them to a grand jury to testify against your family members. That's Basta. Yeah, 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 and the family members um, is key here because that's what, it, what you know, the, um, they c would grant the younger guys immunity, you know, to testify against fathers, uncles, close friends. And it was all, it all revolved around a gambling case, uh, you know, illegal gambling in the form of, um, you know, private casino and some uh, uh, video poker machines that were put into taverns and bars and such. Now, which ironically, is now which, legal. Which, well, yeah. to interrupt. No, yeah. I know. The state of Kansas now legalizes yeah. sports betting, boats everywhere. Well, Everything it, they were focused on, this you can now do legally. Brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. <laughs> that's right. I'm a paid endorser of that. Thank you. God bless well, you. And that's, you know, that's why there was a, one reason why there was a lot of sympathy amongst the general population in Kansas City towards the Boston movement is they realized that, you know, the writing was on the wall with, with casino gambling, that it was going to go legal, you know, and this, it, instead of the, you know, local guys from the north end and the northeast 
you know, running the show as far as gambling. It was just going to go to corporations and, and the government, yeah. right? So there was a lot of sympathy for the Boston movement. Plus, a lot of people sympathized with sons or nephews who actually went to prison instead of testifying against their loved ones. And that, I think, is the key takeaway from the Boston movement. I think that's why Sam Robley was so passionately involved with it because, you know, he, he grew up with these people and um, he, he's, he's friends with all of them and um, they're part of his his community and he saw it as a case uh, of an abuse of power where um, sons, nephews, whoever were being compelled to testify against loved ones. Just didn't think that fair. It goes against the whole Italian American tradition that we're family first, right? And you don't, you don't ever uh, snitch on your family member, you don't snitch on anybody, let alone a family member. So when guys were actually willing to go to prison federal prison for many many months instead of testifying against their family and friends a lot of people in KC respected that and admired that and so the Boston movement really grew and took on kind of a life of its own a lot of people nationwide actually nationwide yeah respected it, that it did. and as a fellow Sicilian we're a defiant bunch that's the bottom line we have love for our country my grandparents immigrated over here on boats and, and they loved America. They lived in New York their entire lives, loved the city of New York, worked hard, started businesses. But what, what the government did, what these U.S. attorney's offices did in the 90s, you know, was criminal. You know, and see, and, and, and we're not Italian, but the, we grew up in Northeast. And those were all my friends. And, they, and I used to hang out with a lot of guys that their families were connected or they were connected. But I didn't think of it that way. Those are the guys I went to grade school with and high school with. And I remember, and you remember this, before they went away, they, the FBI started to fuck with me a little bit and followed me, and then they wanted to talk to me. And he always did a great job of keep steering me clear and keeping me separate from everything. So I, you know, there was no, I wasn't hiding nothing because I didn't know nothing. But I was around it enough to kind of have an idea. And so then I remember you, you let them talk to me, but you were there, and you remember where they, down at the uh, Denny's on Broadway in downtown, and they're asking me all these fucking questions, and I'm really like, I, I, don't, I don't know what you're don't talking know anything. about. Yeah, you know, but you're, you're yeah. why were you with this guy? Because he's, I've known him for 12 years. We play football together. We play basketball together. Why are you with him? You know, why are you with you, your, your dad's apartment this night? Because he's my fucking dad. I mean, I don't know what do you want me to say. And so they were just, but there was nothing there. Uh, you know, like I said, we're not Italian. Jimmy Conway over here. We're, I'm Mexican and he's Irish, so there's a mix right there. But anyway, it was, I, I remember that they, they didn't jack with me as much as they jacked with other people, right? And so, but you, like, what, like, you had, like you said, FBI agents assigned to you that were assigned to some of the, the, the big guys in the East Coast. Yeah, you know, I, I, I even remember back then when I was in my early 20s, I just thought it was a little much then, and I think it's a little much now, to look back and realize that I had FBI agents and surveillance teams assigned to me, you know, 24 hours a day. And there's a lot of things that have gone on in the past 20, 25 years, and it just makes you wonder, like, what were they thinking? Back to, it was all over sports betting, gambling, maybe drugs, maybe whatever the vices were at the time which a lot of them are now legal. Marijuana is legal, sold in dispensaries. Sports betting is legal. You can go online. You can go to the boats. So I don't know. It just seem, Again, it just seems like a, a huge waste of taxpayer money that they were so focused on young men such as myself and some of my friends at the time that you know a lot of really negative and bad things were able to happen in this country because they weren't focused on them. They weren't focused on what was really a threat being posed to this country. So may I also say this podcast uh, partially brought to you by from the earth dispensaries. Well, I'm also a paid endorser. So I'm, I'm getting paid to endorse all the things that hey, they were. Somebody's got to keep about. the hey. lights on. And I understand that I'm, hey, I'm okay with I'm that. Open minded Kansas. That's yeah, right. Do it all. And so, that's right. Oh, but come, you got to come to the microphone. You got, you got to say something. Nope. Come on, come on over here. Well, when Steve St. John senior is getting up off the stool to want a microphone, this could be anything. Yeah. I might have to apologize. Come on, step, get right up on that microphone. I, I just, he was talking about the FBI giving him a hard time. I was in Leavenworth, and uh, he, he keep me abreast of what's going on. I said, just tell him to leave. He ain't got nothing to say. So, uh, 
They kept, I kept asking him, where's the money? Where's your dad's money? Stephen said, I don't know what you're talking about. He ain't got no money. He's in jail. So anyway, a few weeks later, he comes up to Leavenworth to see me, and he said, Dad, I need to talk to you. I said, oh, well, fine, you know. Can we walk outside and, you know, where the you can visit outside a little bit? I said, yeah. We got outside, and he leaned in my ear, and he said, Dad, where's the money? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell do you mean, where's the money? Where's the money? Are you, Show are me you the fucking, money. Are you an agent? I said, Jesus Christ, Stephen, there ain't no money. I just thought I'd ask. I said, okay, that's it. If you don't I'm ask, you don't know. I'm thinking about going out in the backyard and digging holes. And all kinds of shit. I'm buried, just, no, yeah. sir, I'm sitting there thinking, like, where would, where would he have... Put the money. I was thinking, so I, fuck it, I'm just going to go up there and ask him. Yeah. All right, so uh, back specifically to this book. Uh, and, and, and you mentioned in, in the previous podcast you were on, we talked about your story. But what about Mike's story uh, appealed to you to where you wanted to write about it for people that don't quite know all the, uh, all the details? So a lot of it was the the conviction, uh, what he was charged with and, and ultimately convicted with, uh, which is felony murder. And from a legal standpoint, that is very interesting. Um, and a lot of people, I, I felt like a lot of people were unaware of that, a very uh, unusual law. And so without getting too far down in the weeds, you know, if a, if a felony is committed, maybe it's robbery, and somebody dies during the commission of that felony, then the perpetrators of the felony can be charged with murder, whether they killed somebody or not. It doesn't matter how the person died. In Mike's case, Joe Riley's case, you know, Joe Riley was killed by an FBI agent. Michael Albanese, Albanese, sorry, was charged with the murder of Joe Riley, even though Michael was not even in the room, not even in the building. Uh, he was out in the parking lot. So that was fascinating. And um, I just uh, thought I would dive into that and explore the Missouri's very uh, harsh felony murder statutes, one of the harshest in the country. And, you know, if, if Michael had been just a couple miles over the state line, <laughs> um, he, he would have had his – if, he'd, if he would have been convicted in the first place, he would have had it overturned uh, because there's precedent for that. So, yeah, you know, the uh, felony murder rule is something that a lot of people uh, consider to be antiquated, outdated, cruel, abusive, um, not fair. You know, uh, the prosecutors uh, who, who prosecuted Michael disagree. Uh, and consider it to be uh, an incentive not to commit crime or to commit fewer felonies or to be careful, to be more careful when you are committing a felony. So those are some of the you know arguments on both sides. But it is a very interesting, uh, obscure uh, law. that, uh, And then this case was just about the best illustration of that law that you could have found anywhere. And uh, as we know here in this room, Mr. Albanese did 25 and a half years in state prison for the murder of Joe Riley, who was shot and killed by the FBI. And nothing's changed with that law since, since that time. Not in the state of Missouri, but I can tell you that other states throughout this country have either removed it from their books or modified it to where it could not be used the way it was used against me. Um, back then. So um, I also think that's why Court TV covered my state trial in Platte County Live, which is where he first learned about the case and started to get information about, you know, the sting operation and what happened. So, but yeah, Missouri has not removed it from their books. And, you know, I, at times I, I become passionate about maybe fighting and working to, uh, get it modified. It is not a deterrent. If you look at Kansas City's homicide rate or crime rate, it doesn't seem to me at least that 
the felony murder rule makes our city safer or cleans our streets up in any way, shape, or form. So to me, it's just a tool that's there. If they want to use it, they can. You know, I served 25 and a half years, and I never came across one other person in prison that was in, in prison for a similar situation such as myself. So, Yeah, he really is the uh, poster boy for uh, the felony murder rule. And, um, you know, there was another young man who was there that night that was not charged with felony murder because he turned state's witness. Um, there were certainly well, people say that, but actually, uh, his name is Nicklin Franca, and for some odd reason, Flat County prosecutors at the time and I went to high school with him or the U.S. Attorney's Office just decided not to charge him with felony murder. He was sitting next to me in the same car in the same parking lot, and they charged me and not him. It was eight nine months later after we were both indicted in federal court for the cocaine conspiracy that he decided to get in bed with the government and become a rat. Uh, well, I say rat. He really wasn't a rat because he was a liar. He lied through his teeth. He took the stand, said whatever he thought they wanted him to say, and he weaseled out of a lengthy sentence. So, so why did they prosecute you and not him? Was there ever a reason given? That's a question. Given, or? You know, even Frank Hayde, during the course of writing the book, asked them that question, and, of course, they've never had an answer. Uh, we... In fact, their official on-the-record answer was, well, we considered charging Nicklin Franca, um, and that's it. So. Well, it, you know, I, I've got to push back just a little there because, if it, you know, the, the, I did talk to the federal prosecutor who, who, and his take on it is this, that there was more evidence against you than Lan Franca because you had been with Joe Riley for a longer period of time that day. So that's that perspective. Um, was it because also well, I you mean, were I under I think it's fairly clear to everybody, and I don't think – I could be wrong, but I don't think even the federal prosecutors or state prosecutors would um, deny that ultimately Nick Lanfranca got off easy because he turned state's witness. I mean, I think that's – you know, you, get, you, you exchange leniency for cooperation. Well, that well, seems to me what happened here. Was it because – partially because, I mean, you said you were under surveillance and they had been – trying to get you or looking at you and they weren't looking at him before the fact? Is that is that part of it? You know, I think Todd Graves uh, said that in the book, that as a prosecutor, they uh, were definitely wanting to convict me of something and to send me to prison. But to push but that's a slippery slope. I mean, it's you, a very you got two slope. people in the car, you can say, well, he's guilty, but he's not. And to push back a little more, yes, Joe Riley and I spent a little more time together that day, but if you watched the state trial or attended the trial, Nicklin Franca and Joe Riley had been meeting with the FBI informant Joe Bartels numerous times mm -hmm. talking about crimes, criminal activity, and not once was I ever present or involved in those conversations. Bottom line, they should have charged me and Nicklin Franca and then allowed Nicklin Franca to work down from that charge. It was a selective, maybe a vindictive prosecution. Well, what's also interesting is that uh, – the, the underlying felony was, uh, you know, that, that Michael was charged with was, um, you know, a cocaine conspiracy. Right. Right. And it was Lan Franca who had a prior cocaine Drug conviction. 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 And not me. Right. So, so. Th that all, uh, you know, makes the whole leniency element, you know, that much more uh, significant. So you you see you've thought about you you you, you want to I don't know activist or or do something to try to to try to change things in the state of Missouri, but as part of you just want to put everything in in the rearview mirror and, yeah. and not fuck with it anymore and say you know what I did my time I've got a good part of my life ahead of me I don't I mean because that's got to be a little bit of a, a a debate in your mind like you know, how how much you want to go through this again, even though you want to do something to change it and, and stand up for what you believe in, you also, I'm sure, would like just to, to move on with your life and, and not, not deal with it anymore. Definitely. I mean, as much as I would like to see the felony murder rule removed from the books in the state of Missouri, I know that it would be a huge, uh, you know, obstacle to, to overcome because you have to go through legislation. You have to 
it's a lot. And I feel like I've spent enough of my life dealing with attorneys and law firms yeah. and, you know, having served my time. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not devoted to doing anything that I have to talk to attorneys with on a daily basis. I, I've had my fill of lawyers and mm-hmm. law firms. They've, they've, um, yeah, they took all our money and yeah. then some, which is fine. You know, it, it, it's water under the bridge. The same way them not ch- charging Nickel and Frank is water under the bridge. I mean, you know, karma reared its ugly head and the guy served a little time, got out, got cancer and died. So I'm still living and I'm going to live my best life and he's gone. So it, it doesn't matter. You know, we're talking about it and these are facts, but at the end of the day, it's all water under the bridge as far as I'm concerned. For, for people that, that uh, are, are going to read the book and maybe they've, you know, they've, they've read these other books and watched these other movies where it ends in the 1980s, is, is there anything else that like, maybe when you research this or work with it that surprised you or that might surprise yeah. people that, that maybe, uh, you know, that, that they don't expect or what they'll gain from reading sure. the book? Yeah, um, you know, if you're familiar with the... Uh, the Mafia and the Machine or, or Casino, you know, uh, the 1980s, 70s, and 80s uh, era of, of the KC mob, then you're probably familiar with Oscar Goodman, who oh, yeah. uh, was the biggest mob lawyer in the country, later got elected to mayor of Las Vegas and served, I think, like four terms. And now his wife is mayor. Um, so he's a real iconic figure, you know, and part of his brand um, – forever was that he would not represent rats and that's what endeared him to a lot of mafioso because uh he was a principled defense attorney he was just he used to say things like the only good rat is a dead rat you know and and things like that he was really known for that Uh, but in this book i uncover for the first time proof that oscar goodman did in fact represent a rat and that happened right here in kansas city and this was a, a fellow who was closely connected to the Riley family. Now we're coming full circle back to okay. Joe Riley, his father, Travis Riley, who your father knew in prison. Um, so Travis Riley was the, the, the head of this insurance fraud enterprise. And he had a close associate um, who turned on him, wore a wire against him, And this was a guy who had swindled Mutual of Omaha out of $236 million. Holy shit. And that was back in the 80s. So whatever that would be now, maybe four hundred and fifty million or something. I know there are people who are like how? Like how did how did Uh, loopholes fuck did they loophole? Yeah, right. Loophole, (laughs) just you know, it's all in the book. I I don't wanna get too far in the weeds with it because and you know, insurance fraud is not the most exciting thing to talk about. (laughs) It's quite profitable though. Very profitable. It was for Mr. Riley. Right. Mr. Riley was always the smartest guy in the room. To, to his, you know, that's a compliment to him, but I also think that was his demise was that yeah. he he always felt like he was the smartest man in the room and could outthink anyone. At some point, you're not, though. And then at some point, you're not. There's always, it's like being tough. Everybody thinks they're tough. They can box, they can fight. There's always going to be somebody tougher. Right. Always. I promise you that. There were people smarter than him. And eventually, Congress put together a subcommittee to go after Mr. Riley and he came to realize that he wasn't the smartest yeah, man they, in the room anymore. Uh, he, was, he was known nationally. His, his operation was international. Um, you know, he had things going on in Bolivia and other parts of South America. He had things going on in American Samoa. Uh, he had shell corporations all in the, in the Caribbean uh, and even in Europe also. He was working with French crooks. Um, so this was really an international... This is very much a Kansas City story, but uh, you go a lot of different places in this book. It's a lot of moving parts. Yeah, and there's a lot of geography in it, including, which I find very interesting, Michael's experiences in Little Italy in in New York City and Brooklyn and his family history on Elizabeth Street in Little Italy. Um, Because Michael has that connection, it gave us an opportunity in this book to really take a deep dive into literally like a two-block area of uh, Little Italy, Elizabeth Street, uh, which has this fascinating history, you know. 
Um, so, yeah, but the but the Riley family, getting back to Oscar Goodman, they had this close associate. He was the guy who swindled Mutual of Omaha out of the hundreds of millions of dollars. And I, Oscar Goodman did, in fact, represent him here in Kansas City. Not well known until now, but so that was interesting. And then there's other well known people in the book. Uh, you know, Claire I saw a picture of Lou Savarese, the Savarese. heavyweight Lou fighter that, that was on my Lou. show several times back in the day. Was he? Yes, he was. Wow, oh, I got to because I, gotta I find those episodes. I had a connection with uh, a guy. Tony Holden was promoting him for a while, and I I, I knew Tony because I was friends with a couple of fighters that he promoted. Uh, Tommy Morrison for a while and Randy Carver, but anyway, he promoted Lou Savarese for a while, so I had Lou on the show a couple of times. Oh, I gotta, he I had gotta a good listen. run. Are those episodes still available? Oh, I can find them somewhere. Yeah, yeah I'm going to check those out because I've heard his podcast. He's got a great podcast. Right. So how was how was Lou involved in all this? So uh, Frank Riley, who was part of the Riley clan, Michael knew him well. Um, well you might be able to tell this story a little better. Frank Riley had somehow become a manager for Lou Savarese who at the time was living out of the Bronx, New York. Uh, he was, you know, the great white hope. He had some After big fights. Time, he had oh, yeah. some great Huge big fights. fights, and he, he was a really good heavyweight. We hung out with him many times uh, here in Kansas City. He'd fly in. We'd go to dinner, have drinks. Great guy. Lou Savarese was just a really uh, classy boxer. So long story short here, actually Frank Riley was arrested – he had fled to the Dominican Republic, and he got arrested flying in to see Savarese fight Mike Tyson. George Foreman. I guess he That's just the, couldn't that, help that was, himself. That was the Foreman fight. The Foreman fight? Yeah. yeah. But he fought, George I Foreman. mean, he, he, this guy fought Foreman. He fought him all. Tyson. He fought Buster Tyson, Douglas, Foreman. Yeah. Uh, and he was good. Spoon, I think. I mean, he fought, he fought literally every leading heavyweight of that era, you know, and, and he, he, like Foreman, it was a draw. It was a, it was a split decision. No, it wasn't a draw. It was a close split decision. So, I mean, yeah, this guy was the real deal. Himself, he was, no, by any he means. Was, he could throw he hands. Was a hell of a fighter. You and spoke it, to him, actually, right? Yeah, I did speak to him briefly. I, I, he didn't really have too much to say about, uh, he, you know, he, he's, he's, he kind of maintains the code. He's like, I, I don't want to say anything that might look bad against Frank Riley or any of the Rileys. So, but he was nice enough to return my call. And uh, I did think that was an interesting element of this story. The fact that the Rileys got involved in the pro professional boxing, uh, they used some uh, stolen money to help finance Lou's career. Now, Lou didn't know that. Lou doesn't bear any responsibility for that. Um, it was none of his business or his knowledge where that money came from. Uh, I don't. I don't think that he. I don't even know if he knew that they were involved in shady dealings or not. But uh, anyway, yeah, great guy, great podcast. He's he's old school. Uh, he reminds you of a throwback fighter, maybe like a, a Marciano type. Lou fought in Kansas City at Kemp Arena back in 1989. I'm sure that would have been on a Tommy Morrison undercard. Uh, but some of the names uh, that, that that he went through, that he fought in his career, and boxing fans will know uh, all of them, and then most people will know a few of them. Um, Buster Mathis Jr., George Foreman, David Izon. Uh, James Buster Douglas, Michael Grant was a heavyweight contender for a while, Mike Tyson, uh, Marcus Rohde, who was from St. Joe, Missouri. When I had my professional fight, Marcus was in the main event at the Beaumont Club in Westport. Uh, Want to know, by the way, I, I did win that fight, Mike. So. Um, <laughs> Tim Witherspoon, uh, like I mean, Evander, his last fight was against Evander Holyfield and uh, went the distance. Like what? Yeah. What an unbelievable roster of fighters that he got in the ring. He way. fought he the won. who's who. He, yeah, he, beat, he beat Buster Douglas. Yeah. Wow. That's unbelievable. Who beat Tyson. Right. Something That's exactly said right. Oh, absolutely. And so, uh, and so I, I'll ask you this, because when we uh, talked last year, the, the, the book wasn't finished. Now that it's, it's finished and it's in print, how do, you, how, do you, how do you feel about it? So I've read the book, and I think it's a great book. I think... Uh, true to what he said in the beginning, and I'll get to that in a minute, Frank Cade wrote the book from an unbiased narrative. I thought he was very fair in gleaning information from all sides. Um, he and I, speaking of sports, he and I first started talking maybe back in 2009 after the machine came out, 
because I had a book idea about a young man from Kansas City named Tony Temple, who was a Rockhurst sensation running back. He was the first freshman at Rockhurst High School to play varsity football, went on to run the football at Mizzou, and then played on what some people would argue is the best Mizzou Tiger football team ever in 2006, 2007. He finished his college career at the Cotton Bowl, broke a 50-year-old record, uh, actually just got awarded a Cotton Bowl Hall of Fame award, which is pretty special. So I had this book idea or this story called Plan B uh, using Tony Temple as a template uh, because there's a lot of high school and college kids that, you know, their families, they themselves think that they're going to go pro someday, but there's such a small percentage uh, chance of you going pro, and then what do you do? You have to find a plan B. So Frank Hayden and I first started talking about my idea, and he kind of reversed it and flipped it around about my case and the felony murder and the sting. And, you know, we just we started talking, and I'll add, and I'll go on record, you know, people have questioned me speaking to a member of law enforcement, and he did clarify. He, he's a park ranger, you know, uh, which to me is in a whole different category than a normal law enforcement. So my, my record is intact. Uh, I, I have a perfect record. He'll tell you that. I think he went on Gary Well, Jenkins I know that he did 25 that. and a half years in prison, and I know that he never talked to anybody or said anything about anybody during that whole time, you know he might have been able to get a reduced sentence if he had said certain things about certain people. He never did. So credit where credit's due. Um, you know, and I appreciate him saying that it's unbiased, and I worked really hard on that. I mean, I did not pull any punches with Michael. I mean, everything's in there, you know, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it was the same thing on the other side with law enforcement. Uh, you know, one of my sources was Agent Halter with the FBI. He was a, a wonderful participant, even though he and his agency made some mistakes and did some things that were heavily criticized. He was very open and candid about it. So I found that really interesting that in, in both cases, on both sides of the aisle, um, you know, folks were willing to um, be very candid about this case and about everything. Um, you know, and nobody seems to resent me for putting it all out there, telling it like it is. Uh, I think everybody's come to terms with their own mistakes, some regrets, um, you know, and I've tried to be fair across the board. I think it worked out. I, I, I certainly hope so, and I appreciate you saying that. Well, which, by the way, Agent Halter, I was surprised to read in the book that Agent Halter – as the lead FBI agent and the, and the person who kind of orchestrated this drug sting uh, admitted that there were mistakes made, probably mistakes made on his part, that there were things he should have seen that he didn't and ultimately maybe caused their FBI informant, Joe Bartels, to get shot in the shoulder and wounded and Joe Riley to lose his life. So what, so, what, what happened to the agent that, uh, that committed the shooting? Uh, so I did not have a chance to interview him. He, uh, he, he was, he was cleared in the shooting. It was ruled justifiable very quickly, uh, after too, it happened. Too quickly? Uh, you know, not from my perspective. I mean, I, I it's all, it's on video, okay. all this, and there's a series of still shots in the book that walk you through it. And from my perspective, I know that Joe Riley has some friends, family members that would feel differently than me maybe including this gentleman who's sitting next to me. But from my perspective, Joe Riley had just shot a man uh, twice and was preparing his third shot when this FBI agent burst into the room and shot and killed Joe Riley. So I do believe that when you consider the severity of the crime, which was attempted murder, um, that the shooting was entirely justified. You know, there was a, a, a pivot also from Joe Riley towards the agent so the agent could also claim that he, he also feared for his own life. But even if he hadn't feared for his own life, I feel like the shooting was justified because uh, there was a, a man who was getting shot by Joe Riley. So as a law enforcement officer, uh, I believe that the shooting it was entirely justified and, and meets the criteria of the landmark court cases, Graham v. Connor, Tennessee v. Garner, 
Uh, I think when you analyze that shooting through the, the lens of those of those cases, I don't think that there's uh, you know a judge or a jury anywhere that, that would have um, ruled it any other way. So I would say probably not too quickly. But I understand that some people do feel differently about that. Do you? Well, I do. And the flip side of that coin, it, Joe, first of all, Joe Riley's hard to defend in this particular case, and and I don't try to defend him or his actions. Um, I I do think, and I will say that there were people serving decades in federal prison for phone conversations of for drug conspiracies. So I didn't understand what the FBI's mindset was. You know, arrest the guy as he's walking up the steps. Arrest him when he walks in the door. I don't know what they were looking for exactly. I'm not sure what their end game was. And, you know, uh, FBI agent Craig Arnold shot him in the back five times with a six-hour 45. Now, was it justified? Uh, was it a proper use of their deadly force policy? Of course, they said it was. Um, it just seems like overkill. It seems like they could have maybe arrested him before it got to that point. But, again, this was their doing. So yeah, I think know. that's the key, and that's the way members of the jury felt. Uh, after Michael's trial, you know, the, the jury actually came out and said, we did find uh, Mr. Albanese guilty. However, we do have some issues with the conduct of the FBI in this case, and that did complicate our deliberations. So that was, you know, straight from the jury, straight from the foreman's mouth. Come on over. You got to come to the microphone. <laughs> he gets mad. You got to come to the microphone. Come on over here. And Steve St. John Sr. This just happened the other day. I was up in the bank with my grandson. Let's get in his car. By the way. So um, there was a cop standing there. And I, I think I knew him from way back. And uh, <clears throat> we were talking. And and uh, my, I told him about that case. I said, do you remember that case? He said, do I? I'm talking about this just the other day. He said, do I? He said, I was a homicide detective on that case. Okay? He says, we got up there. He said, there was no yellow tape anywhere. There was literally not a crime scene. Everybody packed up and left, and and that agent got flown out of there to Washington that night. Now, that would make me think something's going on. They snatched him up out of there and flew him to Washington, D.C., or wherever they flew him. Well, this detective told me, he said, my boss don't fool around. He had a homicide. He said, call the FBI. And he said, let me tell you something. You get that agent back here tonight, or I'm filing charges, manslaughter on him. And they said, well, you can't do it. He said, I, I can do anything I want. He said, that's, that's what we're going to charge him for if he's not back tonight. So obviously the FBI snatched him and, and flew him back. Because this homicide detective said, you know, we don't play that. We, that's not the way we do things, you know, as far as the, the scene. And they ought to let the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, since it's local, do mm-hmm. their thing. But the FBI thought they was above that, I believe. You know, that's very interesting. But I never heard that. This is the first time yeah, I've ever and, heard anything. And I know the detective's name, too. Anything having to do Trust with Trust me. That. And he told me, he said, you know, we've never run a, came across a case like that. So he said, we. I felt that very strange. Well, and, and if you don't mind, Steve, I'll just add, it. I mean, one thing I've noticed about you, you and I being, I interviewed you for the book, you're yeah. in the book, you know, you knew Travis Riley in federal prison, um, you served 10 years, you you shared a cell with Lefty Two Guns Ruggiero, yeah. um, of the, uh, you know, the, he was part of that famous movie, Donnie Brasco, he was, he was a big guy in the Bonanno crime family, but I've noticed from being friends with you on Facebook and all that, even despite your history, you seem to be very pro law enforcement. I mean, you seem to be a guy who respects um, the job that LEOs are doing on a daily basis out there. You know, I, I'm, is that accurate? I wouldn't be one, not now. But uh, I'll tell you a quick story. My, I got a good friend, and Stephen does too. Fifty-eight years old, he just joined the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, and he's from the old neighborhood. And I said why would you do that? And he said, I just want to make a difference. And so it, it, now is not the time to be a cop, but 
the fact of the matter is, is when Gary Jenkins got a hold of me through a church member that wanted to meet me, he said, you know who I am? Well, no, I don't know who you are. Well, he said, I was one of the ones that arrested you. Are you mad? I said, I'm not mad at who? He said, well, me. I said, for what? I said, did you help help me get in trouble? He said, no. I said, well, <laughs> you got to do your thing. I do mine. I said, you know, obviously you did it better than me, but, you know, I said, I, I don't have no hard feelings. And I don't know how people can have hard feelings. I mean, unless it's a deal like that FBI thing where they shot them out of town. And it, it just it rubs me the wrong way the way they did that. And it just bothers me because it was in Platte County, and I, it's just all all jacked up. But, uh, yeah, the guy told me, he said, yeah, he said, we went up there. And he said, wasn't nothing there. Well, I mean, neither one of you two, Mr. St. John or Mr. Albanese, seems to me to carry too much bitterness. I mean, it seems to me like both of you have just focused on getting on with your lives after your release and, um, you know, building relationships and um, doing positive things. And, um, you know, Michael, you mentioned, you know, maybe getting into activism with felony murder or something. So, you know, I get that. But, um, But I'm not seeing or sensing a lot of bitterness or anger from you or from you i mean i i've seen some of the things you post on facebook that you know where you're you're like uh, you know uh, encourage you know you where you 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 uh support share this if you support police officers and you do sure I you do support yeah, police I, officers. Saying, you got a lot of good friends that are on the police yeah. force and you respect them and you do because i you and you tell me that all the time and he all he does you're absolutely right about that yeah well and you know it's 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 a hard job you know, and 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 you're um, focused on on family and rebuilding, you know, a career and job skills, and um, you know, helping your mother out, and you know, um, being with your your lovely girlfriend and all these things. So, you know, I just that's why I'm in, sitting in here with you guys today. You know, I don't feel that either one of you. Well, have you ever met somebody who? Uh is full of bitterness and anger and resentment because their lives didn't necessarily turn out the way they wanted sure. them to or thought they would. They're miserable. And yeah. They look miserable. So it's just a choice, you know, that you don't have many things in this life that you can choose. So your attitude, the way your brain looks at things, your perspective is is a choice that we do get to make. So and that was an uh, inter- uh, inspiring part of the book, I think, is when you talked about attitude and your mother came to visit you and uh, you were kind of at a low point at that time, and she, you know, was talking about, hey, they can't take your attitude away from you. Nobody can do that, and you can adjust your attitude, and you did, right? Well, if I would have sat in prison and said, oh, this felony murder rule, I'm doing life for sitting in a car, I'm a victim, if I would have placed myself in the role of being a victim, then I'm bitter, angry, upset, miserable, and I just wasn't going to do that, so... Um, I'm winning. You know, I did my time. I came out. I feel great. I'm healthy. Um, if you let it affect you now, you'd still be in prison. Mentally, I would you still know? be locked up right. mentally. So I, you know, over this past year, I've just, I've really enjoyed life and I've had some real successes, gotten a lot accomplished. I've had a fun year and it's just going to get better and better. I want to go on record and say, even me, you know, a former whatever, I support the blue. I think we need more cops in these streets. These kids are out of control. Not a fan of overzealous FBI agents in the 1990s. However, where we're at now, my, you know, even my mother, who's very conservative, uh, she says my case probably could not happen today because people's opinion of the FBI, and not saying they're a horrible agency overall, but there were, and there probably still are, a lot of, overzealous FBI agents with too much power, way too much power. So it is what it is, you know? Um, well, and then you, what you were saying about this not happening today, you know, it's really interesting. There was a case that happened at the same time, or close to the same time that Michaels did uh, in Kansas, just, you know, right over the state line. And Kansas had the same felony murder rule as Missouri. They had the what's called the, 
proximate cause version of felony murder, which is the strictest version of felony murder. That covers third-party killing, so it doesn't matter who did the killing. You can be charged with it. Um, Kansas was basically identical to Missouri, and yet uh, they overturned a young man's case who was in a very similar situation as Michael was. And they wrote in their decision that they did not believe that uh, even though it was the letter of the law, that that was not the spirit of the law. And that was not what the legislatures intended. So they overturned a conviction of a young man who was in the back of a police car when his, co- when his accomplice was shot and killed by a police officer. So imagine you're sitting in the back of a police car in custody. Officer, a few minutes later, shoots and kills your accomplice. And then you who are sitting in the back of the car get charged with felony murder. People are really surprised when they hear this kind of thing. They, oh, I didn't know that could happen. Well, it happened to this man right here, and it happened to this other young man in Kansas. They overturned his conviction. You read about that when you were in I prison. studied that case, and I got to know it well. And what the Kansas Supreme Court said is that when a member of law enforcement kills the so-called bad guy, the perpetrator of a crime, it's in the line of duty. And that was our argument throughout the course of my case is that Let's say FBI agent Craig Arnold, who shot and killed Joe Riley, used the deadly force policy correctly. Well, he's in the line of duty. So I never understood, and I still don't understand, how I can be charged with that person's death. Back to the proximate cause theory of the felony murder rule. It's just a lot. You know, it's probably some law that some Harvard, Yale, or Princeton legal beagle came up with or i think it originated from england yeah it goes way at back one point time. it goes way back yeah. but again few states use it i was a test case at this but point that had to have been disheartening when you saw that kansas conviction overturned such a similar case and yet kansas he, wasn't the only one i mean I, there was a case in ohio there were states like tennessee who took it off their books the exact wording was they thought it was nefarious and unusually uh, unfair and unjust and harsh. So, you know, it's an interesting case. Uh, it, it cost me a quarter of a century inside prison, but, you know, again, I don't, I don't put myself down as a victim and, and, and cry about it. It's done. I did it. You know, I did that. It's over now. Let's move on. And I've always been, like, proud of his, his uh, attitude, because I'll be honest with you, when, when he got out, I was afraid he would he would go back in, you know. Yeah. And and he promised me he would. And I remember, and I don't even fucking think you know this. I before right before you got out, I sat down. I asked to have lunch with somebody. It was a good friend of yours. Uh, that, huh? Uh, Vince. So and I just said I said, I I'm concerned that my dad, you know, and I. Can you help me keep him out of trouble? And you know, and he said, I, I don't think you have to worry about that. Your dad, you know, when he gets when he gets out, he ain't ever going back in. And he hasn't, you know, and he's he's right. That's right. It's a, but but he, you know, and I because you because I the, w- some of the worst times of my life were not going to see him, but leaving prison and having to leave him there. I've heard that all story of, a lot. All because you have to leave yeah, him there. Oh, yeah. be, it'd be fucking terrible. Going there, yeah. getting there, being with him, great. Right. Driving home, it would just tear me apart because I had to leave him there. And so now, I mean, he's 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 done great, and I feel like he's taken you under his wing and helped you get adjusted, you know, back to life. And I've been proud of him for that. Now, ask him for direction somewhere. You might be <laughs> fucked. You're not, you you don't want to do well, that. You'll wind but up he'll wind up in Timbuktu. Right. You. I mean, you don't know where yeah. you're gonna end up. You know, but you'll. But I think he has been. As so long as you don't end up back in love. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So much, you know, so much I mean, of a mentor or whatever to kind of help you get readjusted for back to life. various reasons, the recidivism rate has always been extremely high. Um, it, it's not even something I struggle with or have to consider. I think right. I've done enough time for one lifetime. And, and, and luckily for me, and, and this is a good thing, things have changed so much that I would have zero interest in getting involved in anything criminal or illegal. It's a different world. It's a different world and a good world, but, you know, accept the challenge and find ways to make money legally because there's a lot of money out here to be made. You just have to work hard at it, and you have to find something to get into and get up every day, and, and it'll be okay. Trust me, I've been home a year, and I've done well. 
and I'm going to do even yeah. better. So, like I said, some some of the shit that my friends were getting popped for 25 years ago, I'm getting paid to, in, to endorse now. Isn't that so something? The world's a beautiful place. Frank, I want to uh, once again just to wrap things up. Tell people uh, where they can get the book, and just maybe again. Uh, for people that are thinking about getting this, I recommend this. A, a terrific story if you want to hear more and it elaborates on everything that we've talked about, why this is different than some of the other mafia books and even different than the book that you wrote previously, why you think people will enjoy it, and it's necessary for anyone that has an appreciation for the deep history of Kansas City. Yeah, so if you read The Mafia and the Machine, this is a, a great sequel in a way, but it stands alone uh, as a story of young men at the end of an era. And there's uh, a lot of interesting material in it. There's a lot. There's some famous people in it, um, not just the ones we spoke about, but others also. Um, it's a fascinating story that's very local, very much a Kansas City story, and yet uh, it, it, you travel all over the globe. You know, um, it's available uh, at Book Baby at the Book Baby Bookshop. So if you're able to go to the Book Baby Bookshop and then just do a little search for Mafia Dreams, it'll pop right up. And you're just a couple of clicks away. It's the same price on Book Baby as it is on Amazon. But as an independent author, a local author, you know, I make a lot more money if you buy it off of Book Baby. So Book I Baby. do appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> and look, and I'm no Scorsese, but I, this smells like a movie to me. Hey, I mean, I'd go yeah. watch it. I'd go watch this movie. Well, you know, know, Scorsese's name is in there. Oh, because yeah. He actually grew up on Elizabeth Street next oh. to my grandparents yeah. and my aunt and my dad. Yeah. And, and they. it's funny because they... I used to hear him tell stories. They thought he was a weird kid because he used to carry cameras around. Yeah, yeah who's weird? Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Artistic back then right. wasn't accepted. So yeah, uh, yeah. I think it has the makings of a movie, even more than more than the Mafia and the Machine, because the Mafia and Machine is like a hundred years worth of history. You'd have to make that a series, but this is compressed into into fascinating. you know a half a dozen years or so, um, and uh, it's uh, you know seems to be well received and uh, had a lot of good. Getting some good reviews. Got a good review in the Northeast News just today. So very appreciative of them. Uh, Which, by the way, my mother, who was not in favor of or a fan of me involving myself in this book in any way, shape, or form, she says, what are you thinking? She read the book, and she loves it. She thought he did a tremendous job. Uh, I'll also add that you're going to be at the Kansas City Public Library on Sunday to do a book signing and have questions and answers. We'll do so a presentation. If anybody's and interested in that. afterwards, downtown branch of the KC Public Library, Sunday at 2. So go to, go to Book Baby, Mafia Dreams, a true crime saga of young men at the end of an era in Kansas City. Frank Hayde has been our guest. Mike Albanese has been our guest. T.C. John Sr., you know, better late than ever you got here, but we're so glad that you're here in one piece. Uh, <laughs> and I really appreciate you guys being uh being generous with your time. And again, for having you, us, Steve. Yeah. Get, get this book. You talk about the Northeast News the right here on Hot Mike. And we give it five stars out of five for this book. <laughs> That's, I can't give any more stars. Five stars. All right, yeah. Frank, thank you, Mike, Dad. Uh, until next week, uh, the microphone is off.